Hello, welcome to Randall and Associates. I only have one question. Are you willing to kill people for money? Yes or no? Hey guys, modding games is really, really hard. Working on games in general is already extremely difficult, not only because it takes a lot of work and talent, but because even if those things are present, when things work, they tend to only just barely work. Game making is a process of walking through minefields, where that any new step may set everything off and break the whole game. So now imagine doing that and you're not even getting paid for it. You have no team, and even if you do, they're so inconsistent that you wish you didn't. This is the life of a modder. Making big mod projects like the ones I'm covering in this series often takes years of combined effort from writers, artists, voice actors, and coders, all of whom face immense odds. Creating a mod, creating a story that is worth playing next to the already professional work these volunteers and non-professionals are building on top of is nigh impossible. Most big mod projects are either cancelled or poorly received. Knowing all this, it's no wonder why modders typically suffer such insane burnout either during the creation of a project or, if they're lucky, after their project comes out. Bizarrely, this cannot be said for the author whose work we're covering today. Some Guy 2000 is a very well-known name in the modding community for New Vegas. I'd say he's a more well-known name than any other individual mod author in the community. This is partially because his series of mods is named after him, but also because, unlike a lot of other mod authors, he didn't burn out after his first project or two. Some Guy is responsible for the New Vegas Bounties trilogy, as well as the Inheritance and a few other lesser-known quest and companion mods. Under normal circumstances, I would be covering each of these mods in its own little video, but the Some Guy series is unique in that all of the mods bleed into one another. Characters transfer over, and they all exist to create the series' own continuity and identity separate from the events of the main game. No mods before or since have managed to blend together as well as the Some Guy series does, and my biggest goal here is to give you all an understanding of exactly what I mean by that and exactly how the series pulls this off so well. One by one, I'll be covering each of these projects, giving my thoughts on their stories and mechanics, while covering my observations of the wider series as they appear. I'm going to be covering the mods in the sequence on screen now. Timestamps are below if you're looking to hear about any specific mod and not others, although this video, like the series itself, is best experienced all together. Feel free to skip around as you please though, I can't stop you. Now that that's all out of the way, let's dive into the world, stories, and characters of the Some Guy 2000 series. All this time, everything you've done, your choices, the people you've killed, you can't control that story. You may not realize it, but you're becoming the stuff of legend. Whether you like it or not. When Bethesda acquired the Fallout IP in 2007 and created Fallout 3, there were a lot of mechanics and design decisions that they lifted from The Elder Scrolls, their only other major flagship series at the time, and then adapted into their vision and subsequent product for what a Fallout game by Bethesda would be. Most obviously, Fallout was changed from an isometric game to a first-person shooter, but there are a lot more little things than that. The comedy, for example, became a lot more goofy than the original games, much more along the lines of Oblivion's comedy than the darker comedy of Fallout 1 or the explicitly referential comedy of Fallout 2. There was an increased shift towards environmental storytelling, something that The Elder Scrolls is quite famous for. All this being said though, there are a handful of things that they didn't translate into their newly acquired IP. One of them is the way that those games handle faction quests. Typically in the Elder Scrolls games, each of the many factions of the world would have their own little series of quests specific to them, outside of the main plot of the main story, but which had enough depth to be as good 
and oftentimes better than the main plot. In Morrowind, your relationship to some of the factions of Vardenfell, specifically the Four Houses, did have significant impact in the ways that you ended up completing the main story, but aside from that, in the modern Elder Scrolls games, faction quest lines were separate from the primary quest line entirely. By making separate side quest lines, they developed side stories more involved and multi-layered than a story could be were it told from a single side quest. With a regular one-off side mission, you may learn about the characters associated with that quest and share some good moments with them or their group, but that's just it, they're moments. Once you've done the quest, those characters may as well not exist to you anymore. With quest chains like the ones in the Elder Scrolls, you can create a much deeper relationship with the NPCs involved because you're not just a stranger doing an odd job for them, you are a recurring member of their circle. The closest Fallout 3 gets to this is the multi-stage quest you can do for Moira Brown, and while New Vegas does have faction quest lines, they are, for the most part, a part of the main story, so they don't give the same impression that the quest lines in the Elder Scrolls do, that the world is brimming with interesting side stories and characters to grow alongside. Maybe if you want to push it, you could call what you do for the Van Graffs or the Brotherhood in New Vegas this kind of quest chain, but I don't really buy it. Imagine if you could do a series of quests for the followers of the apocalypse in New Vegas, in the same way you could do a series of quests for the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion or the Companions in Skyrim, helping out gradually becoming a known name in the organization and along the way learning about the characters of the group and the impact they have on the wider world around them. That would be sick, right? That's kind of what the New Vegas Bounties trilogy feels like. As the trilogy continues, the plot becomes more and more involved and you learn about and learn to care for its characters more and more, and you work your way up the food chain of bounty hunters in the Mojave as you do it. As the series moves further, bounties become more complex and story focused and strangely emotional at times. Unfortunately, this progression had to begin somewhere, as did this mod series. New Vegas Bounties 1, while charming, reeks of a kind of radiant quest feeling for most of its runtime. The bounties you receive even the first part of this series feel less like infiltrating a house party and staging a real-life murder mystery in Oblivion, and more like getting Go Here, Kill X radiant missions from Nazir in Skyrim. Most of the targets feel like this, although it is made better by a lot of them having their own interesting or funny character traits, like how you can kill ghoul Freddy Krueger or a sniper that's gone insane. This mod is pretty purely what it says on the box. It adds a series of bounties you can go kill, taking you to interesting locations and giving you unique weapons as you tick each bounty off. It is an almost entirely gameplay focused mod on its own, and while the gameplay is fine, this mod isn't necessarily exceptional as its own product. Its pacing is frankly awful, and there isn't a large amount of room for choice in how you go about any of these bounties or the conversations with the character who gives you them. Your dialogues with Randall feel robotic. You oftentimes have no other dialogue options with him than yes and no. Despite all this, Randall's characterization is still all right, especially close to the end of the mod, which does a great job at setting up the conflicts of New Vegas Bounties 2 and 3. On its own though, the mod feels shallow until its last 10 minutes. When you come back from one of those fetch kill quests near the end, Randall is nowhere to be found. Supposedly killed, then you have to track down the man who ordered the killing, the leader of Randall's primary competition in the Mojave. This is the first time in the mod that I actually felt any personal motivation to do the bounty hunting, and it was a much more enjoyable time than the Radiant style missions prior. The Judge, the leader of Randall's competition, is a really cool character who you can deal with in a couple interesting ways. You can straight up kill him, you can convince him to kill his guards and take you on more personally, or you can taunt him early in the conversation, which pisses him off so much that he summons even more help and the fight becomes basically impossible, which is hilarious! Of course taunting would do nothing but piss him off. This is a normal human reaction to being called a fat loser by some bounty hunter kid, of course you get pissed off. This is awesome because it's completely subversive to the way that New Vegas and the wider modern RPG genre does dialogue interaction. In RPGs, speech checks or special dialogue options are usually the obvious go-to choice. You see a speech check or any option with brackets in front of it and you sort of just assume that it'll make things easier for you. You're picking a role-playing option and you're being rewarded for skill investment. This is how this stuff works. But rarely do developers have the balls to make things harder for you when you pass these checks. 
More games should do this though. If you try and use a science check on a street gangster, for example, they should rightfully call you a fucking dork and try and kill you. No, 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 no. I, I, I just wanted to talk to you about the blockchain. No, fuck. They have no reason to care what you know or don't know about computers. Having more choices like this in games would make dialogue way more engaging because instead of clicking the auto win button whenever you see the word speech on screen, you'd have to actually think about how the person you're talking to would receive the things the speech check is saying with the knowledge that even with perfect skills in some areas, different characters will react to your expertise in those areas differently. This is a minor thing, but it's something that the mod did that made me happy. Even if it turns out to be unintentional, it's a genius choice as far as role-playing goes. The author added an option later to join the judge, which leads to a quirky, non-canon little quest line where you do some bounties on people who, unlike the people you've been hunting in New Vegas bounties, don't deserve to be killed. So you sort of have that option if you want to play an evil sociopath contract killer. It's a cool choice and I'm glad he added it, but it's generally regarded as non-canon, so... Wait. Canon? How can a mod have a canon? By the nature of it being a mod, it is already non-canon, right? Well, this is where the Some Guy series becomes really, really interesting. This is why I wanted to talk about this series in the first place. Remember how I said that most mod authors retire or get burnt out after their first project or two? In cases like that, their mod operates in its own bubble. The characters of the mod are present in the mod and nowhere else. You're not going to find characters from a mod in other places because the mod author only made the one work and as such their characters are bound by the limits of that one work. The Some Guy series is interesting because it's not just one mod, it's several. And in a genius design decision that I want to high five the mod author for making, the mods occupy the same canon and all reference each other. The characters you meet in New Vegas Bounties sometimes will be referenced by characters in Some Guy 2000's other mods. The targets you kill aren't just radiant targets for you to kill in a mod even though they initially felt that way because you'll hear callbacks to those characters later and go oh yeah i killed that guy now i'm finding a past victim of his or someone who knew him and this creates a sense of cohesion that no mod author has ever managed to pull off before. Hell, most games don't even do this stuff. One of the reasons New Vegas is so good is because all of the quests bleed into one another, and the characters weave in and out of each other's quest lines in such a way that you are convinced that instead of them all being just side quest givers, they are characters who exist in this world and know each other and interact with each other. Some Guy 2000 obviously noticed this and emulates it in his work, and it's fantastic. In the canon of the Some Guy 2000 series, accepting the judge's quest doesn't happen, and New Vegas Killers is pretty much a what-if spin-off. It's fun, but it's not really worth analyzing as in-depth as everything else. Before we move on, I want to trace back to New Vegas Bounties 1 with all this context about the nature of the series in mind. With a regular mod, I'd be asking questions like how fun are the missions, how well written are the missions and their characters, and how well do these missions fit together and fit in the context of the game they're put into. However, with the knowledge that the Some Guy 2000 series is basically a universe of its own built into the universe of the game, a more appropriate final question would be how well do these missions set up the world the author is creating and make a foundation from which the next mods will build. And the answer to that is that New Vegas Bounties 1 does this extremely, extremely well. On its own, New Vegas Bounties 1 is not good. It feels like a series of radiant assassination quests capped off by a good cliffhanger ending. Randall himself isn't super developed over the course of the mod, now and again you'll get dialogue outside of the bounty details, and while a lot of his dialogue in those moments is pretty cliche, on occasion you'll get an interesting detail like how he's got prejudice against ghouls. Most of your attachment to him is really built up at the end. All this being said, when you view the mod not as its own thing but part of a wider series and universe, it's a great chapter one, so to speak. This is why I'm covering all of these mods in one video rather than splitting them up. Most of New Vegas Bounty's 1's quality lies in how well it sets up the events of the author's later mods, and you can't truly appreciate that without actually seeing how it plays out. Before we continue the Bounties trilogy, I want to talk about a few of the non-New Vegas Bounties mods in the series. The Some Guy series has one, technically two, companion mods that fit alongside its quest mods. 
I say technically two because one of these companion mods is an incredible thrill ride with a super well fleshed out new character, while the other is a super mutant whose only line is saying Motherfucker? in various tones and speeds. Motherfucker. 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 Uh, um, forgive me for not doing an in-depth analysis of that one. The first one I mentioned, though, is called Russell, and it centers around a new companion of the same name. Russell was once a member of the now-defunct Desert Rangers, a faction you may recognize as the centerpiece of the Wasteland series, but a group that is actually canon in the Fallout universe and by the time of New Vegas has since merged with the NCR. Russell wanted no part of this, and now he's a grizzled bounty hunter who you can recruit into your party. Having a recruitable bounty hunter in this series of mods makes total sense. Not only does it give you a partner in crime of sorts during your missions in New Vegas Bounties, but it serves to aid the feeling I mentioned previously that the world Some Guy 2000 has built is a cohesive and interacting one. You aren't the only bounty hunter in the Mojave, and beyond that, you aren't the only bounty hunter that's featured in the New Vegas Bounties trilogy. Russell's a bounty hunter that fits entirely outside of that series, which makes the profession of bounty hunting seem more common and realistic in this world. Anyway, Russell gets a quite long quest that involves, you guessed it, a bounty. Fortunately for my sanity, this bounty quest is actually really, really good. The best quests in Vegas Bounties 1 felt like little investigations. The mod would push you, in rare occasions, to actually think for yourself a little and find clues leading to the person you're hunting. This made those quests play, well, more like hunting and less like going to the character's exact coordinates that Randall conveniently had ready for you. Russell's quest is a significantly more evolved and involved version of those rare moments from Bounties 1, but stretched out over a couple hours and it's great. It has some really cool set piece moments and environments like this train tunnel full of ghouls you have to push through, or these fucking ants. Maybe, um, uh, maybe don't play this mod if you're afraid of bugs. The mod also has a couple actual choices, something largely absent from Bounties 1. You get to interact with people in much deeper ways, convince them of things, and solve problems non-linearly. This is always something I look for when writing about quest mods, because creating meaningful RPG choices is harder than a lot of people realize. This mod does it pretty well up until its end. The final location of the mod is a small mining town who's encountering problems with the indigenous population of the area. The town is just alright. The town is where something about the writing sort of kind of gets to me. The writing is usually alright in this series, but the writer seems to believe that in the post-apocalypse everyone talks like they're in an Xbox Live COD lobby. Root sucking, truculent cunts. I run this fucking town. I want you to fuck up in here, just so I can fuck you in the ass. Do what you will, but don't waste my time, motherfucker. It gets tiring after a while, but the author has seemingly owned it as his style, so whatever. He even added a character in one of the later mods who seems to mock the criticism of the author's proclivity for swearing in all his writing. Welcome to fucking Frost Hill. How about a shot of whiskey to get that fucking chill out of you? That's fucking commendable. As far as writing pitfalls go, honestly, it could be worse. Ignoring the language, the characters in this town are a mixed bag. You get some genuinely fun stuff like how this bartender references Al Chestbreach, a channel many of you are probably aware of. Behold, the fine cinema of Mr. Albert C. Breach, who produces the finest films made since the Great War. But there's also some kind of problematic and weird stuff in there too. More of that kind of thing in a minute. You find the guy you've been hunting this whole time, and he insists that you help save the town from the indigenous threat, and eventually the threat that the Legion poses when they come to assimilate the tribe into their ranks. You can kill the guy, but then everyone in the town turns hostile and it's a pain in the ass. There's not much resolution there. If you help him though, you do a recon quest and then arm the town for an assault by the Legion in a suspiciously similar manner to how the player armed Good Springs at the beginning of the base game. It's not exactly an original conclusion, but that's not my real problem with it. My problem with this segment is how little depth there is to the indigenous tribe the town is fighting against. 
I'm willing to kind of forgive this because the mod author has stated that this is one of his biggest regrets regarding the series. He wanted to add nuance to the tribe group, but didn't due to burnout and frustration. The result of this omission is a linear ending that kind of implies that imperialism against indigenous people is good, or at least that it's permissible in certain situations. You never have any chance to speak to any of the tribes people. They're all instantly hostile, and the way that the characters in the town talk about them, it's kind of disgusting, honestly. The Sand Wolves are a lot of root-sucking, truculent cunts who cling to this territory by means of violence and terrorism. They are backwards, mendacious, and utterly intolerant of outsiders. All overtures of peace or reconciliation have ended in betrayal and violence. Prospective farmers and cattlemen must linger behind the town's walls for fear of arbitrary butchery at the hands of inimical natives. I have seen the bloody scalped corpses of men and women slaughtered in the night by sand wolves, the children taken captive. The citizens come to me pleading for resolution, demanding safety for their families. When I look in their eyes, I know what has to be done. Glanton will do it. The tribal menace will soon be purged from this canyon, God willing. You are by no means meant to like this character. In fact, he's actively characterized as an awful person who you should hate. But in the end, this is someone you're supposed to end up helping. This sort of rhetoric reminds me very strongly of the kind of rhetoric that was used to justify my country's ongoing history of genocide against its indigenous peoples. And that bothers me a bit. To clarify before I go any further, there is nothing wrong with this character or any character in the town being a racist. Part of writing in a post-apocalyptic setting is portraying the worst aspects of humanity and human behavior, and anti-indigenous rhetoric and racism is definitely a part of that. The problem isn't that this guy has a bad opinion, it's that you have no reason in-game to disagree with him. Your only interactions with this indigenous group is in combat, and in witnessing their murder of a family and kidnapping of a child. You are, by the way this quest is structured, compelled to agree with this character that tribals are all savage and violent because the game has failed to show you anything other than the tribals being savage and violent. That's the problem. I've linked to a few charities that aim to help Native American and Canadian indigenous groups in the description that you can donate to if you'd like. Anything that I make from this video, I'm gonna be donating to the Indian Residential School Survivors Society, which is a British Columbia-based organization that provides assistance and services for survivors of the Canadian genocidal project of residential schooling. This channel is still pretty tiny, and I don't make very much money from it, but if I'm gonna make you listen to me talk about indigenous rights in a video about Fallout New Vegas mods, I might as well back it up with something tangible. Links to the IRSSS and other relevant organizations are in the description. Russell's quest is good, and his character is great. Part of the reason his character is so good is that he has interactions with the plot events of the Some Guy series in the same way that the base game's companions reacted to its events. Russell will comment on things that you do, places that you go, etc. in many of these quest mods as well as the base game. You can even get a hidden slide in Bounties 3 if your characters met him. That's really cool. I'm kind of beating a dead horse at this point, but this reinforces what I was saying about the quest mods feeling connected. You got my point on that one, no need to elaborate. Aside from the Bounties trilogy, the most downloaded Some Guy 2000 quest mod is The Inheritance, the next stop on our tour. The Inheritance is the most divorced of the major quest mods from bounty hunting, but it still does an incredible job at world building. The Inheritance adds new characters and factions that aren't involved in your line of work, but still exist in the wider context around it. On paper, it's a story about a man coming to terms with his family's past. You receive a message from a very elderly man in Novak who's heard about you and the things that you've done in the Mojave. After the first few mods in the series, some guys' mods lean a little bit into the fame of the courier. In a pre 
previous video I said that characters worshipping the protagonist was a bad thing. However, right now I'd like to clarify that its problems are caused specifically by the characters worshipping the protagonist having no reason to do such a thing, but doing it anyway. When a character from an entirely different region knows who you are and how important you are to the progression of the plot without the protagonist having done something to earn that, it feels like a fourth wall break. The Inheritance and some of Some Guy 2000's mods weren't doing this by having the player do things to be known prior to characters actually knowing who they are. At the beginning of New Vegas Bounties 1, you're nobody, and nobody recognizes who you are until you do something big like killing the leader of one of the biggest bounty hunting firms in the region, perhaps. It makes sense that people would know of and respect the courier once the courier has done things like this. The problems only arise when the courier hasn't. Anyway, this old man has heard of you. He's heard of the things that you've done, both in the base game and in the Some Guy series, and he asks you to deliver a letter to his abandoned son. This man is about to die, and the letter is meant to hopefully clear up the many questions his son may have, as well as to bequeath the first step to acquiring his son's inheritance. The old man was once a member of the Enclave, a faction known in lore as fascists who almost got away with genocide twice, and known in real life for being the guys with the armor that the worst people on the internet use as their profile pictures. It has been scientifically proven that people with Enclave profile pictures are incapable of doing anything but spouting the worst takes you've ever heard in your goddamn life. Almost as bad are the guys who unironically identified with Liberty Prime and the Brotherhood of Steel. What is it with reactionary dipshits and fictional organizations who wear power armor? Uh, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess, I guess that makes sense. <sighs> that sucks. To get the old man's son, Bradley, his inheritance, you need to fight through a couple quite fun little dungeons that are abandoned enclave bunkers. Something I'd like to mention here is how well the Some Guy series does its combat encounters. They are genuinely fun and challenging, which isn't something I can say about much of the combat in New Vegas. Sometimes it's great because it's challenging, sometimes there are multiple ways around it, and then sometimes he throws a couple dozen glowing ones at you in a bunker that had previously been empty, and guess what? They respawn. The fuckers keep coming until you can find a way out. It's infuriating. I love the combat in these mods. Mwah. Once you reach the final area where the inheritance is meant to be stashed, you're locked in a room, and there's a man on the intercom who'd like a word with you. You weren't the only group looking for this treasure. The Inheritance sets up a faction in the world of the Some Guy series that you hear about quite often, but don't actually get a lot of interaction with. This group is known as the Syndicate, and they're your classic Fallout 2 mobster group. New Vegas kind of tried to recreate the feeling of the Fallout 2 mobsters in the casino families of the Strip, but in my opinion, they didn't really nail that mob movie Sopranos type of characterization with any of them, save for maybe the Omertas. The Syndicate is as new Reno as it gets, and now they're locking you in a room with the character you've been helping this entire time, and they're only going to let one of you out alive. You can take Bradley in combat or convince him to not go hostile and let you kill him, or to kill himself. There's no way to save Bradley here, which to some may come across as a missed opportunity, but is actually really good, I think, for two reasons. First, it pulls the same trick that Vegas Bounties 1 did with its encounter with the judge, that thing with the taunt just making him mad. In The Inheritance, if you use speech to convince Bradley that he shouldn't fight you and should try to work together with you to take down the guy who locked you in, Bradley, instead of being saved, drinks poison and dies. The most basic Fallout speech interaction ever is convincing someone to not fight you and to find a peaceful solution. It's literally the first speech check in Fallout 2. In the course of a speech-focused playthrough of New Vegas, you do this successfully hundreds of times, and here it is being flipped on its head. Your non-violent speech solution here causes a man's suicide. It's shocking, it's different, and I love it. That reason addresses why it's good mechanically, but it's also really good from a narrative standpoint. If Bradley didn't die here, yeah, you'd dislike the Syndicate a little for making things more of a trouble for you and trying to get you to kill your companion, but they didn't make you kill your companion in the end, so whatever. If you were able to save Bradley here, you would have no personal justification for getting on the wrong side of this faction. With them dying no matter what, the mod convinces you that this group is dangerous, but beyond that, deserving of revenge. The mod concludes with you tracking down the Syndicate guy and killing him, getting the treasure all is good, kind of. Turns out that the guy you killed was just a middleman, because a few days after finishing the mod, you get a letter from the real leader of the syndicate, letting you know that this faction will be back. 
The game then adds in several timed encounters with assassins from the Syndicate who will be hunting you for the rest of your playthrough. At time of writing, there isn't actually a conclusion to this arc of the story. You never kill the leader of the Syndicate. They aren't the main antagonists of the series, they're just a side faction that you manage to piss off, who will now be a thorn in your side and a thought in the back of your mind for the rest of the game. While I would love to see a final showdown between the Courier and the mysterious Mr. K, I'm kind of okay with a loose end like this, one that keeps you on the back foot watching your back. There is now a whole faction who has a bounty on you while you continue to hunt people who have a bounty on them. You also get other side quests later from people who've heard of you and could use your help. For example, these raiders have heard that you've made all that cash taking Bradley's inheritance and they've taken hostages and are now asking for a part of your treasure as a ransom. That's great. Wiping out part of a massive crime empire and then getting a treasure worth tens of thousands of caps isn't something that word wouldn't spread about, so it makes sense that others would want to exploit you to get it or to enlist your help after hearing about your obvious skills. You're a well-known name now in more than just the circle of bounty hunters. Speaking of bounty hunters, we should probably get back to being one of them. At this point in the overarching story of the series, Randall is missing and presumed dead. You can't get bounties from him now, so the plot revolves around you working as a freelancer doing bounties for the NCR. Working for the NCR is, as it should be, different from working for some regular shady bounty hunter firm. There are rules, there are regulations, there is etiquette. Professionals have standards. With these standards brings the addition of non-lethal bounty completion, something absent from Bounties 1 that adds a new layer to the way you play. And alongside that are time restrictions on bounties. The game will give you a time limit, say 72 hours of in-game time, to bring in the bounty or the quest fails. I probably don't need to tell you that this makes each bounty feel more involved and urgent, but I had to tell a lot of people that the intro to that uh, Fallout Nevada video that I made was a joke, so uh, I, I guess here we are. Overall, the miscellaneous quests of Bounties 2 are significantly more interesting, more fun, and more involved than the ones in Bounties 1. You can tell that the dev learned a lot from the first mod and made the necessary changes and alterations to the formula to make New Vegas Bounties 2 what the first mod promised, fun, dynamic bounty hunting. It also helps that you have Russell with you, and you also have the choice of bringing along a new companion, an orthodontist turned gunslinger named Doc Friday. The good doctor is a great character and a great companion who, just like Russell, will have plenty to say throughout the quests of the mod. This being said, for some reason, more than half of Doc Friday's dialogue is unvoiced. This is strange to me seeing how every other character has full voice acting. If you turn the subtitles on, you can still read his lines, but you'll hear nothing. It's a bummer because all of the mods generally have quite good voice acting, but it's not a deal breaker. I still really enjoyed having him with me. The main story of Bounties 2 is far less joined together than The Inheritance or Bounties 3, but significantly more joined together than Bounties 1. Because you've been through the plot of Bounties 1 and The Inheritance, you know their characters, you've even killed a few of them, and the mod picks up where all of that left off. You've killed the leader of a major bounty hunting firm and severed the arm of a powerful crime syndicate. Now you have to go after people adjacent to those characters, all with the hope that eventually you'll discover the location of Marco, a character I haven't really mentioned yet. Marco's a quite dangerous raider leader and bounty hunter who sees you as his rival. He is allegedly responsible for Randall's death, and that's why you're trying to figure out where he is. Throughout the series, you often hear about Marco and find notes from other to him or from him to others in a similar manner to how Ulysses is teased throughout New Vegas's DLC. On top of the micro level bounties and missions you're doing throughout the series, you're also doing one big macro bounty on Marco, and each of the smaller bounties gets you a step closer to figuring out who and where Marco is. At the end of Bounties 2, you meet Sergio, Marco's younger sibling who's trying to step out of his brother's shadow by putting a bullet in your head before Marco can. You meet him in this little street in its own section of the map, and the confrontation has really strong Mexican standoff tension. Sergio is another character you hear about a little before meeting him, not nearly on the level of Marco or Mr. K, but you do hear whispers here and there. The Some Guy series is really, really good at introducing you to traces of characters before you meet them so that suspense is built and when you do meet its antagonist, you're not in confrontations with random people who you've never heard of before. After getting rid of Sergio, the main storyline of Bounties 2 is complete. There are a wide selection of other side bounties you can complete during 
during or after bounties too, and the quests for those bounties are actually given by wanted posters scattered or across the Mojave as opposed to by one NPC over and over again as the bounties want. I really liked this approach, just like with the stun baton and the time limits, it evolves the way that bounties are given in a more dynamic and interesting way. Bounties 2 is a fantastic mod that takes everything that Bounties 1 did with its mechanics and improves it, adds to it, and overall creates, I think, the best pure bounty hunting experience of the entire series. Bounties 1's mechanics and story are greatly lacking, Russell and the Inheritance feel more like side stories that are more focused on their characters and world building than their mechanics or gameplay. Bounties 3 is primarily focused on creating a conclusion to things, a dramatic showdown between you and the rival that's been causing you so much trouble. New Vegas Bounties 3 is unique to the other mods in the Some Guy series in that it takes place in its own open world zone. Russell and Bounties 2 had their own smaller outdoor zones, but they were both canyon type areas, very closed off and very small. Bounties 3 takes place in an area of Utah called Frost Hill, and it's pretty nice to look at. At the time that this mod was released, seeing snowy areas in New Vegas was still pretty rare. We wouldn't get a large sized snowy map to explore in New Vegas until years later, so having that environment and being able to explore it here is great. We are, however, getting ahead of ourselves though, because the mod actually begins back at Randall and Associates, the location where this whole thing started. Here you meet Virgil. He works for Marco and was sent to fetch you to Frost Hill so that you and Marco could meet in person. Virgil has some of the best voice acting in the series to an almost professional sounding level. At any rate, you're here in all your glory. The Courier. Do you get tired of that title? It's not very imposing, you know? Maybe that's the beauty of it. Nobody expects to be down by a messenger. You can tell a lot about him from the way that he interacts with you and other NPCs. When you threaten him or get heated, his tone and inflection doesn't change. This man isn't scared of you at all, despite knowing everything that you've done. He even pronounces Caesar like Kaisar, a now pretty famous detail in the base game that means that the NPC you're talking to has some allegiance or past with allegiance. I'm glad that this mod adopted it. Motherfucker, I will crack your skull open and shit in it. As much as I want to be moved by that arresting imagery, I need to get to the point, Carl. Do you remember the arrangement you had with Marco? Marco? Are you serious? That motherfucker ain't even real. So I took some guy's money and said I'd kick it up to Marco. What of it? It was a scam. No scam, Carl. You knowingly stole from one of Marco's associates, then went on to denounce the whole affair in public. Bad judgment, my boy. <laughs> you, you can't be serious. I was just joking with some boys in free Everyone knows Marco isn't real. Right? Oh, fuck, man. Oh, fuck. Holy shit, man. No Over joke. here! Before going to Frost Hill, Virgil takes you on a few errands to see the impact of your past works. He takes you to see, among others, the wife of one of your bounty targets in New Vegas Bounties 1. Her and her children are now poor and destitute without the money her husband brought in. It's awful that your actions have created this life for these people, and you can in some ways repair that damage, but the worst part of this is that I didn't even remember who her husband was. I had to look it up on the wiki, and even after that I was like, oh yeah, I, I mean I guess. The tragedy of this sequence isn't the consequences of your actions, it's that you don't even remember those actions at all. I killed this woman's husband, and I couldn't even remember who he was, and the game seems to know this. This fine residence is the home of Dana Quigley, widow of the late Tom Quigley. You remember him, right? Virgil's going to these places to do business for Marco, but it can't help feel like he's bringing you along to mock you. Once you arrive in Frost Hill, Virgil leaves and you find Randall now ghoulified. This is a cool arc to have for a character previously established to be prejudiced against ghouls, but it's a little weird to me that his voice is exactly the same from when he was human. Pretty much every other ghoul in a Fallout game has this distinctive raspy voice, and here's Randall just thriving. 
Yeah, I reckon so. We got a lot of catching up to do, but we best do it back at my shack. It ain't safe out here in the open. Here's a spot on your map. It ain't much, but there's shelter and some warm beds. Stop by and I'll catch up on everything. Be careful now. What a king. He's set up a new outpost in Frost Hill, and like you, he's after Marco. A slightly disappointing thing about Bounties 3 is that you can't bring companions. I would have loved to bring Russell through the end of the story. In replacement, the mod gives you this adoring fan-esque character who's fine, I guess? He's no Russell. In order to weaken Marco's hold on the region, Randall has you go after some of his associates, and this is where Bounties 3's problems begin to emerge. This is the dramatic conclusion of the series. This is the highest level. This is the last stop. So what does Bounties 3 introduce to the formula of bounty hunting that the previous mods had built up? The difference between 1 and 2's bounty hunting was profound, so based on that you'd think they introduced some other major shift. They don't. In fact, the bounty hunting regresses. In the dramatic conclusion of the Some Guy series, you are doing the same go here, kill NPC quests you were doing in Bounties 1. To be completely fair though, many of these bounties are more interesting and dramatic. For example, this bounty has a group of children held hostage. Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? And this guy has a tape on him that has the funniest performance in the entire series, and the only time ever in my playing of New Vegas or any of its mods that I had to stop playing the game because the dialogue was making me laugh so hard. I wanted to return the message to you. First of all, thank you for reaching out to me. I'm honored. It really, especially in light, you know, I've had a lot of personal tragedies lately. My dog's been killed. My boss is dead. Uh, however, I'm, I'm going to have to say no, okay, and I'll give you my reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I think Marco, you know, he's your he's your employee. I don't want to disrespect him, but the man strikes me as, as being possessed by Satan, and I don't like that kind of characteristic. I already worked for one crazed maniac that had a, you know, this thing for little boys and hatchets, and damn, that just about got me killed. I don't want to mess with that shit. You're good with them bombs wires and shit. I can't ever do that. I don't know how they do it. I try to cross the fucking wires. I just, no, shit would just blow up, it melt me to fucking pieces. They have to mount me on a fucking wall. Uh, you know, and, and speaking of which, I, I got expenses. I'm trying to get my dogs taxidermied. Mr. Ketchum, no, really, I'll pray for you. I hope you do okay. I think you've got great things ahead, but seriously, take, take this bit of advice. If this is off the record, get the fuck away from Marco, man. Get the fuck out of them mountains. We'll do some good things here, okay? I'm thinking of starting, actually, an establishment, a gentleman's club. I'm gonna call it the Buttered Biscuit. The voice you just heard is the developer of the mod series, Some Guy 2000 himself, which isn't really surprising to me at all. In a lot of mod projects like these, I find that the best voice acting comes from the writers or directors of the mods rather than the actors they hire. This is because mod authors aren't typically practiced directors. Directing actors is a lot harder than people assume it is because there are a million different ways to say a line out loud, and as a director, you need to be proficient at communicating the exact type of way you want your actors to read the lines in the script. It's almost a meme in filmmaking circles for actors to obnoxiously ask, what's my motivation for this scene whenever they're given a line? And as a director, you have to have answers to those types of questions. Why is this character saying this line? How is this character saying this line? What are the points of emphasis? What tones should the actors go for? Oh, hi, Russell. It's, uh, been a minute. I miss you. Anyway, it's hard to communicate all that stuff, so oftentimes the best voice acting in smaller mods comes from the people who wrote the script, because they don't need to communicate it, they already know the intentions for their characters they're voicing because they wrote them. They know exactly in their heads what they want their script to sound like, so it's a lot easier to accomplish that sound by voicing it themselves than accomplishing it by trying to communicate exactly how that line should sound to an actor. Anyway, it's a good tape and it's a standout moment in the series. Oh, oh and, and when I thought that this area couldn't surprise me again, Again, a side quest involves taking down a hermit living in a shack in the forest who sends mail bombs to NCR politicians as an act of political defiance. Yes, you heard me right, a side quest in New Vegas Bounties 3 is the main character taking down the Unabomber. Big meme industrial revolution man Ted Gay himself. On my first run of the mod, I actually missed this quest, and when it said in the slides that he was left alone and continued to mail bombs in his hermit shack, I was like, wait, what? I missed the Unabomber? What the fuck? Aside from this though, the quests are quite bad. <laughs>
<laughs> that, that doesn't sound very good. Let me say that line again. Aside from this, okay. Aside from this though, the quests are, are quite bad. No, there's no way to say that well. <laughs> the world isn't detailed enough to warrant all the walking around you do. The snow is nice as a gimmick and it's cool when you get to your location, but the world isn't well designed. It's mostly empty, the roads aren't clearly designated or continuous, and aside from the same prefab outlaw encampment, there isn't much to do besides the quests. World and building design is something that the Some Guy series is generally quite bad at. Sometimes you'll get a good location, but quite often they hardly feel like real locations, they feel like levels. And that's just when the locations are original. Often they won't be and the author will rip interiors from the base game and put them everywhere. More than half of the saloons featured in the series are identical to the Good Springs Saloon. Reusing assets is an economical way of doing level design. All mods do it, it's unrealistic to expect them to make all new assets and interior cells. That stuff is hard, and sometimes it makes sense to reuse assets for less important areas. That being said, reusing the interior interior of the location that nearly every New Vegas player will instinctively know and recognize as the Good Spring Saloon, and reusing that interior more than once is a really odd choice to make. On top of that, when the series features towns or villages, they're always just one street with buildings on either side. Like, that's weird. Surely if you can string together a cohesive mod canon with characters and factions interweaving between mods, you can look up some Google street maps and design your towns and zones around real places. You don't even have to have an understanding of urban planning, just don't do the same thing every time, please! PLEASE! Anyway, the characters you hunt in these missions aren't interesting enough to warrant the blatant regression in gameplay quality. I was actively hoping each new bounty was the last one before tackling Marco. I wanted them to get to the point, which is a feeling in the series I hadn't felt since Bounties 1. Not a good feeling to get, and unlike the many good callbacks Bounties 3 does make... I only have one question. Are you willing to kill people for money? I'm just Josh and your partner. Had to ask, for old time's sake. It wasn't something I was happy to relive. Once these bad bounties are done, you're told to go into a building adjacent to Randall's so you can get details about Marco's location. You're then gassed, bound, and dragged. Turns out, Randall setting up a major outpost in a region controlled by Marco and his gang was a little too optimistic as pretty much everyone in the area aside from Randall and you were working for Marco. You got set up, and now you're face to face with... Wait, Virgil? Virgil was Marco the entire time, which explains why Virgil was such a surprisingly well-voiced and well-written character when you first met him, as well as why he wasn't scared of you when you got more angry at him. You had no idea who you were talking to, and now he's got you, Randall, and the entire town of Frost Hill held captive. Because Frost Hill is a town full of criminals, Marco has made a deal with the NCR that he'll take care of Frost Hill's criminals in exchange for his own freedom. And of course, by take care of, I mean, no Russian. Please don't do this. By the powers invested in me by the New California Republic, I hereby authorize these agents of the justice system to collect unlawful bounties. This is great. Being kidnapped by a character you've simultaneously already and never met is great, but we kind of have to have a conversation about Marco. I've been hyping Marco up through the last couple segments of this video so that you can hopefully experience the same thing that a player experiences while playing the series. Marco is teased and mentioned in nearly every one of the Some Guy series mods. You hear how he's ruthless, cunning, and violent. You cross paths with his victims, his allies, and people desperately terrified of him. This character is hyped up so, so much for tens of hours, and then you meet him and he's kind of flat. I don't mean that like he doesn't have a cool backstory, he totally does, but it's relayed to you in notes and not in dialogue with him. His dialogue is so disappointingly generic for a character that should be anything but. Marco is a topic pretty much everyone who's played the series can agree on. The ball was dropped when it comes to his writing. It's a real shame too, like I said, the voice actor is one of the best in the series, and yet his writing as Virgil was way better than as Marco. A lot of people like to compare him to Ulysses, as I mentioned, partially for good reason. Similarly to Ulysses, he's hinted at and teased throughout all the series' of stories. He's the boogeyman of the background who you slowly learn little by little about before a final confrontation at the very end. This is definitely true, but a lot of people also like to compare the way they're written, and I have to push back on that one. Ulysses' dialogue, while a little circular and obtuse, at least deals with the topics and themes of the DLC storyline and the base game. If you think Ulysses is a bad character or that he's poorly written, you're wrong! 
But even if you do believe that, you can at least admit that Ulysses tries. Even if you think that the writing doesn't stick the landing and that Ulysses is a pain in the ass to talk to, he at least tries to bring up the politics of the Mojave and tries to be an effective foil for the courier. Marco doesn't even seem to be written as though his character was meant to be anything other than a big bad. An evil man who you shoot in the face. Once his massacring of Frost Hill is complete, Marco kills Randall and buries you alive for killing his younger brother, Sergio. Listen to his dialogue here. It's so edgy and over the top. I can't take it seriously. Your mentor is dead. Really dead. I'll face no legal or governmental consequences. Quite the contrary. I'll become a respected citizen, leaving this town while the worms gnaw on your rotting corpse. You remember that when the air thins out. If you could do it all over again, would you even come here? So much to ponder in the darkness. Rest easy. Close it up, boys. When you're designing antagonists in any medium, one of the best ways you can make your antagonist convincing is to ask yourself in the writing room, what does this character do for the story? And if you can't concretely answer that question in at least one way beyond he gives the protagonist someone to be mad at, you should ball that piece of paper up and incinerate it. Your character is bad. Okay, okay, let me illustrate what I mean with an example from Fallout. What does Father Elijah do? do for the story and the world of Dead Money and New Vegas as a whole. Well, first of all, he has you collared and obeying his whim, which sucks. You have a drive to find him and get revenge on him for putting you through all that. But that's baby's first villain shit. What else does he do? Father Elijah gives you insight into the Mojave Brotherhood of Steel, of which he was once an elder. By learning about this madman, you learn why the Brotherhood and the Mojave are the way they are. You hear his name in the base game and you go, man, what a guy. Why would he make all those dumbass decisions at Helios? one and then you meet him and he's like oh this is an actual insane person this is this is uh Oh, oh, he also makes you see Veronica, one of the game's companions, a little differently as well. Veronica was quite close to Elijah when he was in the Brotherhood, so learning about Elijah is learning a little bit about Veronica through his influence on her and helps put her personal arc in the wider context of her life. And on top of all that, his character is an example of a few of New Vegas's core themes and messages. New Vegas is a game with a lot of themes, but specifically, Elijah embodies the theme of power and the theme of letting go of the past. Elijah is obsessed with the power power that the technology of the old world could give him, and that kind of power drove him into madness and desertion from his only home, the Brotherhood of Steel. His obsession with old world technology can be read, as many things in New Vegas can be, as an inability to let go of the past. Both his insane desire for power and his obsession with the past have made him the antagonistic figure that he is, and portraying him in these ways reinforces the game's messages. We should be careful about what power can do to us, and that the past must be let go if we want to make a better world. So let's recap. Father Elijah, as the antagonist of Dead Money, serves as a character for whom we seek revenge on and whom our anger towards creates motivation to play through its story. His character makes us see one of the game's major factions differently. Technically too, if you think about his decisions at Helios 1 in the context of the NCR, as well as giving us new insight to a companion and a confidant of ours. And finally, this character reinforces the game's themes and messages by serving as a living example of those themes and messages. Through all this, Elijah makes us play differently, interact with the game's world, World differently and makes us view the entire text of New Vegas differently. This is how you write a character. Back to Marco though, what does Marco do? do? Well, he fake kills Randall once and then real kills Randall again. We like Randall. That sucks. We should kill that guy. He's characterized and written to be a massive dick throughout the series. That sucks. We should kill that guy. He kind of makes us see the world a little differently because a lot of the people you killed in the series reported to him, but those people sucked, so Marco sucks for working with him. That sucks. We should kill that guy. Basically, the only thing that Marco does is give you reasons to kill him. You don't feel for him. He doesn't reinforce any themes or conclude any arcs. He's a big bad, nothing more, nothing less. This is why his character fails. Obviously, his buried alive thing doesn't work out, and you have a showdown in this cool but kind of out of place cemetery area. The mod then ends with a slideshow, but we're not quite done talking about this series yet.
There are three more mods in the Some Guy series I've yet to mention, believe it or not. The King of the Ring is a heavily gameplay focused mod where you work your way up as a professional boxer, something fun that existed in Fallout 2 that I'm glad the author picked up. It's cool, especially since your agent is a ghoul voiced by the mod author himself, which after all these stories you've experienced of his, having him literally be in your corner is a fun time. Another is Checkpoint Gary, which adds a wave defense game mode if that's your thing. Not really mine, but it's not bad or anything. The final one is a quest mod like the ones we've previously talked about called The Better Angels, a post-ending mod meant to tie up various loose ends left in the wake of the mod series' ending. You're taken to yet another closed-in canyon area where the NCR have stationed, and you help them out in a few different ways before a final wave defense battle with the Legion, just like in Russell's questline. Just like the battle in Russell, it's quite fun and really difficult, partially because it's designed that way and partially because on top of battling all those constantly respawning Legionaries, you have to actually battle the game's engine. As in both of these battles, going two minutes without crashing is extremely, extremely rare. The crashing takes a lot of the tension and drama away from these scenes, but this type of battle is quite technically complex with so many individual NPCs running around, as well as timed spawning and artillery fire in an open world space. It's a lot for the engine to handle, so I get why it can't always work out smoothly. A few of the characters at this NCR base are characters who you've met previously in side quests or bounties, and they get their time to shine and show off what they've been up to since the major confrontation with Marco. I was always a fool for my Johnny, for the one they call Johnny Guitar. Cuddy, I can put up with a lot. The farts, the bullshit, the grab ass, whatever. But if you sing that fucking song again, I'm gonna shoot you right in the fucking face. The fuck is your problem? You're like everybody else, Howdy. hating on a good fucking song. That's a great track. It's got a lot of soul and heart in it. I think it's fucking great. You're just upset because it's not a song about the plight of the of the downtrodden ghouls. Well, fucking where? This has fuck all to do with the legitimate plight of the ghouls. This is about good and evil. Johnny Guitar was written and performed by Satan. You're an agent of the devil. You fucking know that? When you sing that song, you are in league with Satan. Apparently, this mod was start to finish produced in two weeks, which is impressive, but evident. There's not a whole lot to the Better Angels. There are small branching paths here and there, but they're typically one branch affairs that don't contribute much besides giving the player two different ways to accomplish the steps you take before the final battle. It's alright, and it has its shining moments, but it isn't anything exceptional to write home about design or writing-wise. This is, in all senses, a victory lap. The author has spent so much time and so many mods creating this cohesive world with all these interconnected characters, stories, and arcs, and this is a wrap-up for a few of the ones that weren't concluded by the end of Bounties 3. It's a good time as that, and bizarrely, the series ends on a quest to take a slave child to his remaining family members in the Mojave. It's an uncharacteristically kind and optimistic quest in the series. Most of the writing here is very tongue-in-cheek, very violent and dark, but here, you're ending the series off by doing an unquestionably good deed with no catch. You bring the kid to his family and they thank you you for this and for all the other good things you've done. And that's it. The quest ends and the series is over. This, I believe, is the capstone to the arc the series has been shyly developing for the main character over the course of all of these mods. Ah, yes, we've reached the point in the video where I say that the mod has a deeper intellectual emotional meaning. And you believe me because I'm right and I'm smart and, um... Uh, well, you've watched this far, right? When you start Bounties 1, you're in it for the money. Everyone is. You're killing people who, as demonstrated by Marco in the beginning of Bounties 3, have families. You're just a low-level hitman, and if you want to continue to roleplay as an evil piece of shit, you totally can. That's what New Vegas Killer is, the small what-if type mod that picks up after the end of Bounties 1 if you side with the judge. But, taking the canon path of the series, you slowly begin to develop alongside its characters. You start to do good things for people, helping Russell 
Russell and the town that's a part of his quest mod, delivering the letter for Joe Sellers and taking down an arm of a major crime syndicate despite what the consequences of that may be, you go from doing bounties shadily on randoms to tracking down criminals for the NCR and taking them down by the book. You track a man cross state for a friend, Randall, who grows too to be a more likable, developed, and kind character. The game is slowly tricking you into becoming a more moral character and the best part is you can ignore this arc entirely. You can kill ruthlessly, not free hostages, take bribes, all of it if you want, but the mods nudge you to take the best route by putting it behind skill checks, a trick I mentioned that the series had subverted previously, but here it is, using its knowledge that players will pick the speech checks if they're available to push you in the direction of doing good. And to finish off this arc, you grow from family destroyer to family rebuilder by bringing a lost child home. This series gets a lot of flack for its writing. The moment to moment dialogue can be over the top or janky or obvious. Marco is a poorly executed antagonist and a lot of the series' quests lack nuance. This is all true, but this is where I want to go back to my original point about the series. The moment to moment is only an ant's view of this story. When you look at it bird's eye, you start to see the patterns. The characters, quests, and stories of each of these mods range from decent to awful, but like I said in the beginning, taking any one of these mods on their own would be a mistake. What makes the Some Guy series great is that the sum of its parts is greater than any one of its parts individually. When you look at the Some Guy series like one big mod, one big universe, you start to see its brilliance. How the characters develop over time, how the mechanics push you over the course of the series to see simple tasks like bounty hunting differently, and on top of that, creating an arc for the player that's only fully revealed in hindsight, this series is brilliant. It's unmatched. No other mod series or big New Vegas mod at all does what this series does with its characters, mechanics, and plot. It all connects and it all works together to create something truly special, something that hopefully justified me talking about it for this long. It's a shame that mod authors get burnt out so easily because above everything, the Some Guy series shows what can emerge when a creator keeps at it, keeps adding to their catalog of stories and mods. If there's a lesson to be taken from Some Guy 2000 and his work, it's for artists and creators. If you're either one of those, someone trying to make something at all, a mod, a movie, a video, a book, whatever, what you need to understand is that you won't ever get it right on the first try. Your first work, unless you're incredibly lucky, won't be amazing. In all likelihood, it'll be bad and you'll want to quit. New Vegas Bounties 1 is bad. My first video is bad. But if some guy 2000 quit, we wouldn't have Bounties 2. And if I quit, this script wouldn't have been written and this video wouldn't have been made. But if you keep going, after that initial work. Learning from each new creation, you'll start to see the bigger picture, and maybe you'll realize after all your work, you've created something that nobody else has. Something truly yours. And then you can quit. But for now, back to your desk. You can quit when I say you can, motherfucker. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. This is so far my longest and hopefully I justified the runtime. If you made it to this point, mwah, I love you. If you liked this, leave a like, comment to drive engagement so others can see it, and subscribe so that you don't miss what I do next. There are a lot of Fallout mods left to cover in this series, and I have a lot more other projects outside of Fallout that I can't wait to show you guys. That's everything I've got to say though, so thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time.